So I'm thrilled to be here with you. Personally, um, I'm a mom of three girls, as I told you earlier. Mm -hmm. I literally jumped at the chance to pre-read this book uh, and to take the journey on motherhood with you. I absolutely love, love, loved the book, as I've told you many times on email, but absolutely love the book. Um, and we have books for uh, y'all here in Ann Arbor, so I invite you to take them with you when you go. Um, you'll absolutely love it at all. Just to set a, a little context for the book, um, it's a short story collection. There's 12 stories of all different women with all different points of view of becoming a mother or an early motherhood experience, I would mm -hmm. call it. Um, so it's absolutely a great journey. Um, I loved how candid you were. I felt like you told so many behind the scenes stories where I think as mothers, a lot of times we get so afraid and there's a lot of shame involved in sharing some of these stories of seasons that are really hard, right? Yeah. Um, so as a result, we don't share them. And then when our fellow mothers walk through these seasons, they feel so isolated and alone. Um, that they're the only ones going through it. So mm -hmm. um, I felt that you empowered me as a reader and as mothers everywhere to like sh celebrate these truths and share these truths. So I just wanted to thank you thank for you. that to start with. So I thought that was beautiful. Um, I thought your writing was very raw in some places and very romantic, which I loved. And I think the most impressive, because I read a ton, one of the most impressive things that you do is in these collections um, is character development in such a short amount of time. It's really unbelievable how you do that. Uh, Polly takes us into the middle of someone's story and drops us as a reader right in the middle. And yet you're so connected to these characters and you want them to win and you want them to triumph and you're in the season with them. Um, and you really want the stories to end well. So I thought that that was really remarkable. So. Um, so a bit more on Polly uh, before we get too into it. Um, Polly has published stories in an extensive amount of well-read publications and magazines. Uh, she's a book reviewer. Um, she, and many of her reviews and her essays have been published in the New York Times Book Review, as well as many other publications. Uh, she's a teacher as well, teacher of creative writing um, from all levels, from elementary to college students as well. Um, and now she is a freelance writer and a fiction editor for the Michigan Quarterly Review. So she's a local here from Ann Ar in Ann Arbor, um, and she lives with uh, her husband, uh, Cody Walker, who's a poet and teaches at U of M as well. So I don't know if anyone knows Cody Walker. Uh, and their two daughters as well. So um, so pleased to have you. Uh, so before we begin our chat, I heard a rumor that you're going to read an <laughs> excerpt of the book for us. Yeah, well, first I want to say thank you, Stacy, so much for all of that and for reading the book. And thanks to you guys for coming out. Um, I love that people are eating their lunch um, <laughs> while you're listening to me um, talk about mothers and babies and that kind of stuff. Um, I really appreciate your being here. Um, so those of you who have children may be familiar um, with the fact that it can be really hard to get your children to go to sleep. Um, and I um, wrote the story that I'm going to read some of to you today out of that frustration of having a new baby and trying to get the baby to sleep in her crib, um, which seems like such a simple thing, but actually was not. Um, so this is the last story in the book. It's called Parental Fade, and I'll read about the first third of the story. Parental Fade. You can do it the long and painful way, or the quick and painful way, the pediatrician says. The quick and painful way, otherwise known as crying it out, means putting the baby in her crib at bedtime, shutting the door, leaving her there till morning. Whatever it takes to ignore the cries, blast the TV, have noisy sex, take turns leaving the house, this is what we must do. The long and painful way is called a parental fade. Put the baby in her crib and get comfortable in the rocking chair. Don't pick the baby up. Try not to even touch her. Wait for her to settle her own self down, cry herself to sleep. Each night, move the rocker farther away from the crib. Remain in the room for a shorter amount of time. Crying it out takes a few nights at most. Parental fade may take several weeks. Either way works, it's up to you, the pediatrician says. He is the gentlest, smilingest man we have ever met. He sings our baby's name when we bring her into his office. He keeps a musical frog on the ceiling, sets it swinging as he draws the needle for her shots. Look at the frog, he croons happily. 
We cringe. We fear the baby will develop a phobia of frogs. We are exhausted, despairing, mad at each other and at all parenting manuals, at all parents whose babies don't regard their cribs as horrible cages of doom. Our insurance covers a 30-minute sleep consultation. It's coded as a necessary medical intervention. Now our 30 minutes are up. The pediatrician offers a final compassionate smile. Believe me, it works. You'll be surprised. You'll be relieved. You'll be OK. In the car on the way home, we consider our options. Can we get a hotel room for the weekend, pay the babysitter to do this cry it out all night thing? Can we commit to two weeks of being stationed in a rocking chair, pretending to ignore our screaming child? Can we accept that a baby crying is nothing more than a baby crying? That this is only the first of many battles, and we must be strong. We must not yield. We must stay fixed on the goal for the good of all. Our daughter in her rear-facing car seat gnaws on the legs of a rubber giraffe. She is 10 months old, crawling, pulling herself up to stand, pointing, clapping, shaking her head no, saying da and ma, though not necessarily in reference to us. She has two teeth on top and one about to break through on the bottom. She eats mashed sweet potato and peas and banana, but not spinach or apricots or squash. She has her father's broad forehead and rounded nose, her mother's hazel eyes and loosely curling brown hair. She will fall asleep in the stroller and the car seat, in our bed and in our arms. When she's asleep in our bed, she sprawls out, hits and kicks us, sends one of us to the couch. The other one sleeps fitfully, afraid she might suffocate or roll off of the unattended side. If we sneak her into the crib, she usually wakes up. If the sneaking thing actually works, we tiptoe around and speak in hushed voices. Perversely, we miss her. We are in our 40s. We look it and feel it. This doesn't fit with our vision of how the world should work. We should be 23, always. Uncertain of the future, yet convinced of the promise it holds. Though we could potentially be the parents of a 23-year-old, we feel too young for parenthood. Mama and Dada, how can these words apply to us? We still have trouble with ma'am and sir. No, we have to remind ourselves, this is how the world works. Our own parents and step-parents are senior citizens, retired, ailing, acquiring new knees and hips, losing their memories. All of our grandparents are gone. Pictures of these people from another time line our mantle. They are young there dashing in their military uniforms, zoftig in their bathing costumes, stern in their wedding attire. We would like to have known them then, but we were born too late. The 70s will be as remote to our daughter as the 30s are to us. So it's decided, starting tonight, parental fade, an aging rock band, a haircut for the going bald, a chronic illness, the way of the world. We wish we could do quick and painful, but let's be realistic. As soon as we put the baby in her crib, she'll stand up and scream. She'll either never lie back down or she'll collapse in a mangled heap. She'll cry so hard she'll throw up and then choke on her own vomit. We'll have to go in and check on her and all will be lost. Actually, we believe the pediatrician is right. The baby would be fine. She'd work it out on her own. In the morning when we entered her bedroom, guilt-ridden and spent, our daughter would smile her smile of delight, her oldest and best trick, the smile she offers to anyone who shows her a bit of interest, but most of all to her parents who are most in need of it. She's a narcissistic insomniac, preventing others from sleeping if she cannot, a sentimental whore, refusing to sleep alone in her own bed. The most grating of alarm clocks, no radio option, no snooze button. But here are her trump cards. She smiles as if she herself had discovered joy, and she never holds a grudge. We just can't do quick and painful. Though we're not those kinds of parents, the ones who declare on their blogs that letting your baby cry herself to sleep leaves psychological scars, gives the kid lifelong feelings of insecurity and abandonment. Our objection is not on philosophical grounds. 
nor is it out of genuine fear for the baby's well-being. We believe fundamentally, we have to believe, that the baby will always be all right. No, we're softies, weaklings, cowards. It's easier for us to do things the hard way. I'm going to stop there, and I'll keep you in suspense as to whether these desperate parents ever <laughs> figure it get out or this not. parental <laughs> faith thing going. Yeah. <laughs> So Thanks. good, and I think so many of us as parents can relate. And side note, I was like, can you pay the babysitter to do this? Is this actually <laughs> I a didn't thing? try it, but okay, I well, wanted let me know. to. Let's talk, yeah. let's talk. <laughs> awesome, so, um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I loved that, uh, that chapter in the book. Um, so just to jump into some of the questions, um, so there's so many motherhood books out there, as mm -hmm. you know, about the blessings and the challenges of motherhood. Um, and your approach was so interesting to me because it was all about this season of pre-birth to very new newborns, right? Mm -hmm. How did you choose that that was the piece of journey that you wanted to tell the stories about? Yeah, well, just to tell you a little bit about my own background. So my, I have two daughters. They're eight and five now. Um, so pretty much for the past decade, I have been in this season of thinking about having a baby, getting pregnant, um, having a few miscarriages, which is something I address in the book, um, and then having a baby and thinking, oh, wow, I have a baby all the time. What am, how am I going to handle this? <laughs> Um, and so it's, um, it's a period that's very much been on my mind and in my life. And um, I don't know if anybody knows in Ann Arbor, there's an organization called the Center for the Childbearing Year, where you can take birth, kind of birthing classes and breastfeeding classes and learn how to take care of your newborn. And so I kind of thought of this book as like the book of the childbearing years for these various women. Um, and so just to give you a little, little sense of the kind of chronology of, of the book, it's all different characters, but it starts with a couple who um, are having a hard time conceiving, want to have, have a baby, but are struggling with it. Um, there's a chapter, a uh, story, sorry, about a woman um, who is not ready to be a mother and, and has an abortion. Um, there's a story about a woman who has a miscarriage. There's stories about other experiences of pregnancy. Um, there isn't a story actually about childbirth because I found that I could not actually write about that experience. It was a little too, Still too soon. physical. Or, too yes, soon. I was not, didn't feel I was fully there <laughs> when I was giving birth, though I certainly was. Um, but so then I, uh, there's a story about postpartum depression, which I struggled with, story about um, introducing the new baby to extended family, um, going all the way up to that story that I read part of um, Baby is 10 months, you've almost made it through the first year, and yet having these challenges and getting the baby to sleep. Um, so I really wanted to limit it to, to that time frame um, and to zoom in on what's really special and really amazing about that time frame, but also what, what's really challenging in it. Yeah. I love that. How did you know that we needed to hear these stories, and how did you know that you were the person to bring them to us? Yeah, um, well, when I was experiencing this time myself, um, I, had, I had only been living in Ann Arbor for about a year. We, we had moved for Cody, uh, my husband's job. Um, and so I didn't know many people here. I knew a few other people that had young children. Um, but I spent a lot of time on the phone with my friends who had had babies and kind of wheeling the baby in her stroller through the neighborhood and talking to people. Um, but I also spent a lot of time alone with the baby, um, and I found that really difficult, and I kept a lot to myself. Um, and then when my partner would come home, I would kind of burst into tears, and um, sort of it would, some of it would come out anyway um, at that point. So I, um, I think the thing about having a new baby is that you know it's so wonderful, and everyone congratulates you, and it's like your family is complete, and this thing that you've wanted to happen has finally happened, and so you kind of feel like, well, I can't really complain, or I can't, um, I shouldn't be having these negative feelings, right, um, about this thing that I've wanted and now have, and it's a blessing and it's beautiful. Um, so I really felt like when I talked with other people that were experiencing some of these things, it, it was really helpful for me, um, and I wanted to kind of put that out there myself. And for me, writing fiction has always been a way, even though I fictionalize the characters and I fictionalize the situations, it's always been a way for me to kind of address um, complicated emotions that I have myself. And so I really, I didn't write actually until about a year and a half. 
um, until my daughter was about a year and a half. Um, and then I found that I could get back into fiction and look back on these experiences. And then I knew I was thinking about having another child, um, which scared me, but was also like, OK, I kind of forget this stuff, and I need to know it for the book. So OK, it'll be research to <laughs> <laughs> be pregnant look at again it. <laughs> and have another baby. And then I didn't write right after she was born either for a while. Um, but um, fiction has always been a way for me to kind of tap into my own emotions and explore kind of the inner lives of people. So love that. Yeah. Love that. Um, how did you choose, or why did you choose, rather, to tell 12 stories, multiple stories, versus mm -hmm. like create one large novel? Right. Well, so I started, um, I'd always wanted to be a, I'm one of those people that just wanted to be a writer since I was five years old and you know knew what being a writer was. Um, but I didn't really seriously start writing fiction until I was in my mid-20s. Mm -hmm. um, and I started off writing stories. The short form really appealed to me. I was kind of afraid of writing a, a longer work, a novel. Um, but I went to graduate school for creative writing. Um, so that's an MFA degree is what I got, Masters of Fine Arts in Creative Writing and Fiction. Um, so I was in my early 30s at that point, And I entered into the program thinking, OK, now I'm going to get serious. I'm going to try to write a novel. Um, I mean, those of you who read fiction, probably you lean towards novels and not story collections. So I thought, OK, I'm going to attempt this. Um, and in the first semester of the program, I started a novel. And then um, you guys, you all here at Google will shake your head at me. But my computer died. <laughs> and I did not have a good backup system. And I lost oh, the beginning no. of my novel. Um, but the thing was, I didn't care. It was kind of like, good riddance. That, that wasn't working. Um, and so at that point, I really kind of embraced, you know, I really I want to keep writing short stories. I, I love this short form where you jump in um, for a little while with the character, and then you jump back out, and you can move on to something else. Um, so I really kind of dug into the, the short story form um, and kept going with it. And, um, and the characters, as I said, not, in some story collections that are sort of linked, you might have like different characters appear across the stories, so it feels a little bit more like a novel. But for me, I just, I just wanted to keep entering into these different women's experiences and to capture kind of a range of um, a range of people and a range of things that they were going through. And so this, this format really worked for me in that way. That's so interesting, too, because my next question is sort of absolutely related to this, is around yeah. parallels, because I think that was the piece that wove them all together for me, is I was actually writing them down at some point, like, oh, she's associating this with this. And it was so interesting to see how you wove these like themes and variations between all of these different characters um, throughout either one story or many stories, right? Mm -hmm. So I thought that that kept the reader feeling like they were belonging in the same type of a, um, a holistic yeah. book of uh, work. So um, for me, I, even in the story Tanglewood, um, Sam instructs Elise, he says, listen for themes and variations of symphonies. And I was like, wow, this is an absolute beautiful parallel to your work, too. I would mm -hmm. thought that was so interesting how you wove that in there. So how did you think about the interweaving of themes and variations across either one story or all stories? What was your goal around that when you wrote this? Yeah. Um, well, a lot of story collections don't have an overarching theme, and they're just sort of stories. And there are many story collections that I love um, that are like that. But for me, when I was writing stories and thinking about putting a book together, I, I felt a little bit lost. And um, so when I hit upon this idea one day while I was paying for childcare, my daughter was a year and a half, and I was over at the Mallet's library, and I thought, why don't I just, why don't I do this? Why don't I create this chronology of stories? that are all thematically linked through having a baby, um, but are their own, each, each one is their own thing. Um, and so of course the overall theme of the book is motherhood and becoming a mother, but um, there are a lot of other things too. Um, there are a lot of romantic relationships in the book. Some of them, there's one character who um, gets pregnant from a one night stand with a guy from France, and he's off, and she's never going to see him again, and he's never going to know that he's the father. Um, so there are very sort of brief romantic episodes. But then there are also long-term committed relationships where people are having a baby together, and how does that affect their relationship um, for, for the 
woman to be pregnant and, and then to have a baby. So I was really interested in exploring that. Um, I also was interested in exploring familiar, familial relationships between mothers and daughters, um, between sisters, um, between kind of extended families, um, and also friendships among women is another kind of theme of the book and relationships that women have with each other, which in some cases can be really supportive, but then there are also certain jealousies that come up when someone is trying to get pregnant and someone close to her gets pregnant. Um, and so I wanted to kind of think about those, um, those relationships as well. So I think they're all kind of connected with the idea of being intimate with other people and sort of figuring out who you are as you enter into this period of becoming a mother. Um, and so, and, and what kinds of conflicts come up that sort of impede that intimacy. Um, but yeah, something, something different happens in each story and, and they're all about different characters. So good, so good. Um, how did you choose the title of the book? So I know it comes up in one of the first stories, maybe the first story or the second. Um, yeah. But how did you choose that that was like what you were going to name? The well, the title was hard. Titling is hard for me. Um, I, sometimes when I set out to write a story, I know what it will be called, but most of the time I don't. And I write the whole story and then I think, what in the world am I going to call this thing? Um, and a, a lot of story collections, um, you use a title of one of the stories to then title the collection. but Looking over my titles, I just thought there's nothing that really kind of captures the book as a whole. Um, so for a while, um, and I'll watch your expressions when I do, <laughs> tell you this, for a while, um, my possible title was Baby Person. And, oh, OK, a few of you maybe like it. Um, <laughs> Mark but, research right here at Google. <laughs> yeah, but, but some pe I told a few people the title. And they kind of gave me this blank look like, what do you mean baby person? Like a person who's kind of like a baby? <laughs> um, <laughs> and what I meant was um, that expression, right? Like you're a baby person, you love babies, you think they're cute and adorable, or you're not a baby person, which is what one of the characters in here says at one point. Like, I'm not really a baby person, actually. And that's true for me, that um, I love kids, but Babies aren't necessarily my thing, and then I had two of them. Um, I also had a friend. They become kids, though. <laughs> yes, so yes, mine are now eight and five, so I've survived. Um, but um, yeah, I had one friend tell me that baby person made her think of like a man who had like really tiny little hands, like kind of like boss baby. And this was this was just all not what I was going for. And um, and then if you um, just to tell you a little bit about how books become books, <laughs> if you don't know. So I had this manuscript, um, and I, I looked for a literary agent, um, and agents will help you try to sell your collection or your, your fiction, your nonfiction, whatever it is, to publishers. Um, and so I had this agent who had agreed to work with me, but she said, we're not sending this out to publishers with this title, baby person. That, that, that's just not going to fly. So <laughs> I had to come up with another title. And as you mentioned, Stacy, the, um, the title appears in the book. And I, so I kind of co like kept combing through the book. Like, there has to be something in here that I can call this. Um, so I'll, I'll just read you the little section where it appears. And it's the first story. Um, and in this story, um, the narrator and her husband are, are trying to get pregnant, and it's not working. And um, the narrator's sister, Audrey, has thought that she would never have children. She wasn't interested in having children. Um, but she becomes pregnant. Um, but in the scene that I'm going to read, it's before that. And she's sort of um, at a Thanksgiving gathering with, with her mother. We don't feel the need for children, Audrey told our mother last Thanksgiving. You have to need them, I think, so much that you don't think you can be happy without them. Mom shook her head, proud and sad, on its wrinkled neck. That's not how it works. You can't know the joy until. She swiped at a tear that was about to fall into the wild rice stuffing. You just can't know it. Look how happy I'm making you, Audrey said. Um, so it comes up in the, in the book in that way. Um, and when I hit upon it, I really liked that, you know, what does it suggest, right? Of, of course, kids do make us happy, right? And they're such a source of joy. 
Um, but at the same time, I think if we're being really honest about it, there are a lot of times that they don't make us happy <laughs> and they drive us crazy. Um, both little kids and you know adults um, with their relationships with their parents. Um, so I liked that the title was was ironic, um, and then it sort of got at this complexity of you know what what the experience of of becoming a mother is. So yes, finally got it. That's so good. <laughs> um, all right, next we need your advice, okay? So one of the tough challenges that we have here as mothers, all Googlers probably, but mothers here at Google, Google, sorry, is finding the time and energy to kind of do it all, right? It can sometimes feel like at work and home that it's always ever going, and in a good way too sometimes, and yeah. in a good way very challenging, right? And I don't love the notion of balance. I don't think that's a word that we should mm -hmm. all be striving for. I think it's a difficult one to achieve. Uh, it doesn't set us up for success, but I love this notion of energy, right? Like how we create our energy. Mm -hmm. So would love your advice to all of us here at Google, like how do you optimize your energy level for motherhood and writing? Wow. Well, my house is a mess because <laughs> on the domestic scene, I just kind of let a lot of that stuff go and I'm like pawing through my laundry baskets that are in my bedroom every morning. Like I never have time to put these clothes away. Um, so I think I've really, I've really chosen to make work a priority and it's also I mean it's been different for me because I've always kind of juggled part-time jobs and I work from home and I do freelance and the writing I pretty much never got paid for <laughs> until I finally got paid something for this book so it's also I often also feel like I have to kind of justify working right and sort of make the space to work because I could be I, you know I'm home I could be taking care of the kids and I could be doing the dishes and all of that stuff um, so I feel like I've really had to decide for myself. Um, I love I love working, and I have to prioritize it and let other things go. Um, and I think I honestly think too that um, that quality time over the quantity of time is is really important. Um, so you know my kids have been going to full time childcare since they were quite young. Um, sometimes we pay for babysitters on the weekends, and I'm off to the library getting work done. Um, and then, but then when I am with them, I feel like I enjoy them so much more than if I were sort of trying to juggle everything together. Um, and I also think that it's important. I think it's important for my kids, my daughters especially, to kind of know that my work is important to me, and that I value it, and that I love it, and that I've chosen work that I really care about. Um, and so, and I think it makes me, I think it makes me a better, <laughs> a better mother um, to be able to just kind of stake out that work prioritizing along with the kids. But yeah, but I, I love, I love this conversation and I'd love to hear yeah. from you guys how you guys um <laughs> Any tips from the audience afterwards? Too. Catch Polly afterwards, <laughs> yes. too. Yeah, I see Let some me. nodding of heads. <laughs> Great. So I think we'll do one more question, and then we'll move on to, uh, to Q&A here locally, but we'll end the video portion. So um, if you left us readers and mothers with one key takeaway from the book, or if there's mm -hmm. anything else that you want to say to this community, what would that be? I think the, the kind of key takeaway for me is that... Um, becoming a mother, becoming a parent, um, it's, I mean, it's such a rich and fascinating experience. And, you know, and when, once you are one, you are not, you're always going to be one, right? You're a mother all the time. Um, but I think there are so many challenges involved in it as well. And I think that being honest with ourselves, open and honest with other people, um, with other women, I mean, as you said at the beginning, right, so that women who feel kind of alone in their difficult experiences don't feel so alone. Mm -hmm. And I think it's also important for especially our male partners to realize, especially in that period of being pregnant and giving birth and going through so much kind of hormonal and physical stuff, you know, that this is difficult. Um, and I also think it's important, again, for our kids to know um, that we are, we are their mothers, but we are also full people in the world. I know my, I know I always felt that about my own mother. Um, and so, um, well, thank you so much, Polly. Thank, thank you for being you. here. Thank you all for joining us at mm -hmm. Talks at Google. And we so appreciate it. And good luck on your, your tour now that the book launches today. So thank you so much for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.